So I have to tell you this week, I spent a lot of time stressed out about vaccines, about when I could get one, about when other people in my family could get one, how we do it. I went onto the web page like many of you did and tried to figure out how that works. Um, I read the news about, you know, shortages here in one place and surpluses in another place. And of course that, that magical extra dose in the vial that people can't get out. And I of course learned about the new strain and that we're probably all gonna have to get another booster shot once we figure out what it is and how we can treat it. And it got me thinking about how stressed out we've been in general about the pandemic, about the state of the world, and about how we see ourselves in that world. Normally, we're not constantly confronted with our sense of mortality. Um, the finiteness of our lives and with the sense of our own weakness, the potential for getting very, very ill. And really this year we have, everybody has. And I think it's affected us in many ways. And today what we're gonna talk about is a way in which we can use that anxiety, not even the anxiety, that consciousness of our finite nature to help us better understand the infinite, better understand um, the things that we don't understand about the world. God, the divine, the transcendent, pick your word. And that's what we're going to do today. So let's take a moment now to think about not like we haven't been thinking about it pretty much constantly for a year, but to think about our own risks, our own physical risks and the things that stress us out, and to think about the lessons that they can teach us about our belonging. Blessed be.
join me in the recitation of our covenant. In the love of truth and in the spirit of Jesus, we unite for the worship of God and the service of all. reading this morning comes from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians in the New Testament. Chapter 12 verses 6 through 10. He writes, But I refrain so that no one will think more of me than is justified but by what I do or say. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations in order to keep me from becoming conceited. I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to beat me, to keep me from exalting myself. Three times I begged God that it might leave me. And God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weaknesses than the power of Christ that dwells in me. So I am content with weakness, with mistreatment, with distress, with persecutions and difficulties for the sake of Christ. When I am powerless, it is then that I am strong. And our second reading this morning is by the Vietnamese Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh in his book, No Death, No Fear. The section is entitled, Where Were You Before You Were Born? Sometimes people ask you, when is your birthday? But you might ask yourself a more interesting question. Before the day which is called my birthday, where was I? Ask a cloud. What is your date of birth? Before you were born, where were you? If you ask the cloud, how old are you? Can you give me your date of birth? You can listen deeply and you may hear a reply. You can imagine the cloud being born. Before being born, it was the water on the earth's surface. Or it was in the river and then it became vapor. It was also the sun because the sun makes the vapor. The wind is there too, helping the water to become a cloud. The cloud does not come from nothing. There has only been a change in form. It is not a birth of something out of nothing. Sooner or later, the cloud will change into rain or snow or ice. If you look deeply into the rain, you can see the cloud. The cloud is not lost. It is transformed into rain. And the rain is transformed into grass and the grass into cows and then to milk and then into the ice cream that you eat. Today, if you eat an ice cream, give yourself time to look at the ice cream and say, hello cloud, I recognize you. 
By doing that, you have insight and understanding into the real nature of the ice cream and the cloud. You can also see the ocean, the river, the heat, the sun, the grass, and the cow in the ice cream. Looking deeply, you do not see a real date of birth and you do not see a real date of death for the cloud. All that happens is that the cloud transforms into rain or snow. There is no real death because there is always a continuation. A cloud continues the ocean, the river, and the heat of the sun, and the rain continues the cloud. Before it was born, the cloud was already there. So today, when you drink a glass of milk or a cup of tea or eat an ice cream, please follow your breathing. Look into the tea or the ice cream and say, hello to the cloud. If we are afraid of death, it is because we have not understood that things do not really die. People say that the Buddha is dead, but that is not true. The Buddha is still alive. If we look around, we can see the Buddha in many forms. The Buddha is in you because you have been able to look deeply and see that things are not really born and that they do not really die. We can say that you are a new form of the Buddha, a continuation of the Buddha. Do not underestimate yourself. Look around a little bit and you will see continuations of the Buddha everywhere. Therein ends this morning's reading. And now I invite you to settle your bodies and quiet your mind. Perhaps you close your eyes or soften your gaze, turning inward for a moment of spoken and silent prayer. So we'll take a deep, full breath in together. And a deep, full breath out. So much we carry. So much we carry. And so in a time of quiet, I invite you to lift some of that which you carry up in prayer, whether it is a joy, a sorrow, a grief, a worry, or a hope or plea. So in a moment of quiet, let us hold these prayers together. Spirit of God, be with us this morning. You move through us, live within us, and bind us together in sacred community. And for this, Holy One, we give you thanks. This morning, we are humbled by the experience of being in a human body. We are humbled by the continuation of life, 
by the ways in which we do not die. We are not born, but we continue to live, transforming through our various forms. We are humbled by this mystery this morning and possibly even a little bit scared. And so we ask, Holy One, that you be present with and to us as we hold these truths, these truths of something so large that we cannot understand it. This spirit of life of which we are a part. This web of life that binds us together. Mystery. So much mystery. Holy God, we ask that you stir in our hearts a sense of love, a sense of interconnectedness and interdependence. For we know that we are because we are. We know that I am because you are and that without one another, we are not. God, we ask that you might help us to become more loving, more understanding, more humble, and that you might move us to act when it is our call to do so. In your holy name, the love that surpasses all understanding, I pray this morning. Amen. And now would you please join me in the prayer that Jesus taught to his disciples when teaching them how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
I really do love a good pandemic walk. I know that many of you do as well. Leaving our homes to stroll through the neighborhood has become a daily practice for many of us, something that the virus cannot take away. My Facebook and Instagram feeds are filled with pictures every day from my friends on their walks. Pictures of landscapes, selfies of happy hikers, and of course, pictures of everybody's dogs on the trail or on the porch or sometimes just in the house. Now I take one or two walks a day myself and I find them to be crucial, crucial to both my physical and my mental health. They are a reminder, they are a reminder that the wonder of creation and our own small, seemingly finite lives, the wonder of creation and our own lives are not in fact contained in the smaller physical orbits that many of us now have become used to. But what isn't in all of those Facebook and Instagram pictures is something that all of us are also familiar with. When we are out for our walks, when we are enjoying nature, when we are out in the world in any way, even as the vaccines slowly trickle into our communities, we don't necessarily record the anxiety. We don't record the anxiety we feel when someone without a mask brushes too close to us. And we don't dwell in those pictures on our strategic trips to the grocery store or to other indoor venues. And we don't dwell on that fear, that fear in the back of our minds, wondering if every headache or scratchy throat might be something worse than allergies or that perpetual winter cold. And we don't mention, we don't mention the confusion of this time. The confusion about the phases of vaccine distribution, for example, or when or when not to mask or where to stand when we bump into a friend. We don't mention these things. We don't mention these things when we share our pictures, not because we are hiding anything, but because more than any time in our lives, we recognize that these feelings are shared shared by the vast bulk of humanity. It's quite a pickle that we're in these days, isn't it? And saying goodbye to 2020, remember how much we hated 2020? Saying goodbye to that year hasn't changed the pickle we're in all that much. We live with an existential threat that is both universal, generally experienced by all of us, and personal forcing us into problems and conflicts and struggles that are unique to our own situation. It's a fearful time that way. And knowing that our forebears struggled through similar times, it isn't really all that comforting. However, however, we have adapted, haven't we? just as our forebears have in times of war, famine, unrest, and disease. We have found ways to get through our days, to retain the joy in living, and to find solace and sustenance in the midst of this hard journey. Now, in some cases, we have found these things in spite of the pandemic, in spite of it, as a sort of resistance to both the pandemic and to the other crises that seem to dominate life right now. We have soldiered on, 
muscled through and found, after all, well, ways to reduce the risks of the pandemic, to find some semblance of what we consider normal. On Christmas Eve, for example, while most of us manage to gather virtually, like we are right now, and yes, this counts as a gathering, and we managed to get something out of our time together. A few of us brought candles and our masks here to church, to the open windows of the church, actually, to stand outside and listen to Stephen play the organ inside. And then we gathered on January 6th outdoors as well to light candles and to sit in isolation in turn in the sanctuary as a witness to the invasion of the Capitol building in DC. And of course, once a month we gather for communion too. Communion even though it is so cold some mornings. But even as we did these things, even as we exercised our external manifestation of faith, even as we exercise the rituals of our season, as we fought to find our footing, there was and is an internal transformation underway as well that our current anxiety may have actually helped with. You see, in the midst of all the fear and just plain annoyance that we put up with these days, we are also growing in the spirit. Because even though a lot of garbage comes with the storms of our lives, we often find ways to go deeper, to learn more, to find a stronger connection to the divine or the transcendent than we thought possible. Now, in our reading today, the Apostle Paul refers to the spiritual power we can find in our weakness, even if at first it doesn't feel that way. I was given a thorn in my flesh, he says, to keep me from exalting myself. Three times I begged God that it might leave me, and God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Power is perfected in weakness. And right now, who isn't feeling a little bit weak, a little bit at risk? Who isn't feeling a little bit mortal? Not just with the pandemic that we're all experiencing, but with our own individual struggles. Now, there is some good news. There is good news in this passage. Here, Paul is reminding us that our weakness can be a source of strength because our weakness reminds us of something. It reminds us that we are interconnected, that we do not stand alone and distinct, no matter how much we would, in our pride, like to think so. So in our constant awareness of our mortality, we find that we don't just wear those masks for ourselves, we find that we wear them for other people, and that other people wear them for us. Because in some sense, they and we are the same in the great body of the universe. Now, Paul doesn't tell us what his obviously metaphorical thorn might be. And as I've said before, at other times, Paul didn't know he was writing the Bible. He thought he was just sending a letter to his friends in Corinth, who apparently already knew what he was talking about, so he didn't bother to describe it. But generally, generally, we have three guesses about what he means. One is that the thorn was internal, 
maybe a mental illness like depression or anxiety, or maybe the sort of feelings that we are experiencing today. Another possibility is that there was a physical problem, a chronic disease or an injury that didn't heal properly. And the last guess, the third guess, is the least likely, but the most fun, I think, to think about. Namely, that the thorn was a specific person. A specific person who just drove him nuts. So we don't know which it was, but I'm kind of glad we don't. I'm glad he wrote the letter the way he did. Because most of us have thorns right now in all three of these categories. And it is important that we find ways to learn from them. Now, I know that we all have our own struggles, our own stories. We have our own thorns that make life difficult. And at times, these struggles, while our first instinct is often to assert individuality, these struggles contain within them, within them a place for letting go. There is a place for letting go. There really is. And leaning back into that sufficient grace that Paul tells us about today. Now, the big problem, the universal problem of our time, is centered on those thorns, those constant reminders of our mortality. And letting go of our egos, of our individuality, as hard as it is, sometimes gets us to places in our hearts and minds we would never have reached without those challenges from those thorns. Now, the word grace, the word grace has specific meaning for Paul, and probably does for many of us too. But the idea is not original to Christianity, Judaism, and Western philosophy. In our reading from the book No Death, No Fear, for example, Thich Nhat Hanh talks about the clouds. Looking deeply, he tells us, you do not see a real date of birth, and you do not see a real date of death for the clouds. All that happens is that the cloud transforms into rain or snow. There is no real death because there is always a continuation. If we are afraid of death, it is because we have not understood that things do not really die. If we are afraid of death, it is because we have not understood that things do not really die. Which is to say that death is not the end. There is a continuation. There is a resurrection. Suffering is not the end. The thorn is not the end. The pandemic is not the end. Because there is a continuation and a resurrection. So we can struggle against these thorns in our side fight them with our ego and our will, or we can learn from them to see in our weakness a gateway to the eternal. This means that there is something that we can practice in our pandemic walks. In fact, we already have as we place one foot in front of the other. What those pictures do show us is that we have noticed the falling snow and the fall leaves, and the summer flowers, and their rebirth in spring. We have pointed them out to each other. We have celebrated these gifts in our hearts. We have loved them even more this year as the blessing in the darkness that they are. So may we continue to do so, drawing ever closer to each other and to the divine, Elsewhere in his book, Thich Nhat Hanh writes that 
when we are in touch with the suffering of the world, it is so easy for despair to overwhelm us. But, he continues, we do not need to be drowned by despair. We do not need to be drowned by despair. I think we owe it to ourselves, to the transcendent, and to humanity in general to keep looking for the continuation and the resurrection wherever we find it. In our times of ease, in our times of ease, but also in those thorns. Amen. History's been leaning on me lately. I can feel the future breathing down my neck. And all the things I thought were true when I was young and you were too turned out to be broken. And I don't know what comes next. In a world that has decided that it's going to lose its mind Be more kind, my friends, try to be more kind They started raising walls around the world now Like cackles raised upon a cornered cat on the borders in our heads Between the things that can and can't be said We stop talking to each other and There's something wrong with that So before you go out searching Don't decide what you will find Be more kind, my friends Try to be more kind You should know We're going to close today with a few words from Ruth, from the book of Ruth, that are often used at weddings, but I think, um, I think they work for us today as well. Entreat me not to leave you and to turn back from following you. Wherever you go, there I will go. Wherever you stay, there I will stay. Your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. 
Amen and blessed be. This concludes our service. I hope you have a blessed Sabbath day.